Hi everyone, I'm Susan Nash. And as we're waiting for people to join, I just want to go ahead and, and welcome everyone. We have a very exciting presentation today. John McLeod and, and Doug Jordan, who are both geologists, but they're also extremely diversified in the sense that they have done a lot of field geology as well as subsurface. And I want to um, go ahead and, and thank them, but I also want to thank our sponsors. We have two sponsors today. We have Commit Geoscience Services, and we also have Drill to Frack. And um, it, on August 10th, and I'll put this in the chat, we'll have um, links to them. We'll have oh, an, an amazing presentation about how to avoid formation damage, different tactics and strategies for avoiding formation damage for whatever drilling you're doing. <laughs> and then we also have, um, uh, we will have a presentation on uh, August 15th on orphan wells, and that will be Dan Arthur. He will be talking about present current practices and where we are in the state of, of orphan wells, but also some ethical considerations. And the reason it's an ethical considerations is that it's also being sponsored by AAPG's Division of Professional Affairs, and it's part of the ethics um, program. And I just want to, to, to let you know about that. And also want to tell everyone that this is a, a joint presentation between Tulsa Geological Society and also being supported by AAPG. So happy that um, we have the AAPG family here. And just want to encourage everyone to um, attend IMAGE. And also, if you haven't renewed yet, be sure to renew. We're going to have amazing opportunities coming up this year for Tulsa Geological Society and AAPG. So anyway, want to um, go ahead and, and encourage, uh, well, welcome John and Doug, and then ask them to start the program and, and welcome them, invite them to share their screens. Okay, I'm sharing. <laughs> Great. Are we good? Um, you still need to, to enlarge it so it has the full screen view. Yeah. Start the slideshow. Perfect. That works. Okay. Well, uh, thanks for the introduction, Susan. Um, I want to start the presentation today by clarifying one thing, just to get it out of the way. There are two Illinois rivers. One is in Illinois. Excuse me. Let me close the door. And the other one is in Arkansas and Oklahoma. And so the one that we're going to visit today is the latter, not the one in Illinois. Um, here's a general outline of the topics we're going to deal with. I'm going to show you a regional setting, general geology and stratigraphy. I'm going to talk a little bit about chat and tripolite, uh, rocks that are peculiar to this part of the world. Uh, we'll look a bit at dep depositional sequences, sequence stratigraphy and source rocks. Uh, we'll look at subsurface geology, such as it is or, or isn't, and uh, faults. Our focus areas, we're going to divide the lake area into north and south. On the north side, we're going to look at a series of bluffs going from Cookson Bluff to Cookson Bend to South Pettit to Pettit Bay going south to north. And those are going to be mostly Osage, Lower Mississippian Age, or as I call it, Churdy Osage. And then South Ten Killer, uh, there's a couple of features down there that we'll have a look at. One is another fault bounded uh, block called the Snake Creek area. And that exposes Chattanooga Shale, which is the Woodford equivalent, the Bachelor Shale, which, which overlies it, and which is actually this kind of, we think, this brownish unit, uh, perhaps, uh, in this um, uh, feature at Snake Creek, the Osage again, and the Moorfield, which unconformably overlies the Osage. And then South Island is a tourist attraction. Uh, it's a big island that's out in the middle of the lake and it has beautiful uh, token bluffs, but it does have the Snake Creek Fault going through it. And on the upthrown side of that fault is the only Silurian in the lake, the St. The Clair Formation. Uh, I'll also show you, and because there's so much to see out there in so little time, I'll show you a couple of other photographs of things of interest just, just as, as a sample. The primary uh, reference that we use for field work out there 
was a work done in 1958 by George G. Huffman. It's called Oklahoma Geological Survey, Bulletin 77. And what it was, it was a multi-year project to map uh, parts of six counties in northeastern Oklahoma. And um, uh, out of that came five, uh, five of these maps. And it was done by a small army of graduate students, but uh, perhaps interestingly and perhaps not surprisingly, when the report came out, there was only one author on it, George G. Huffman. So actually a lot of the work was done by the, by the graduate students who were enlisted for the task. <clears throat> also, what I've done here is this is the map, but I've overlaid the faults from a GIS layer, a, a recent GIS layer that came from the Oklahoma Geological Survey. Uh, and these are the faults that, uh, that, they, have, uh, that they have named. And uh, it, they stand out a little bit better than they do on the original map. <clears throat> so the title of this is By Land, Sea, and Air. And uh, we'll kind of go through what that means. By sea is the use of boats. And when Huffman did his uh, mapping in here, it seems that he missed a lot of the biggest and best outcrops. And the only reason that we can figure is, well, he didn't have a boat to see them. And so we took care of that. Uh, this is a whaley boat. It's a plastic boat. And it's kind of what you need in lakes that have rocky outcrops around them. Uh, because if you had, let's say, your $50,000 fiberglass bass boat, uh, when you bash up against these rocks, it's going to do a lot of damage. This just this just bounces off. It's even got a nice a nice platform up here that uh, that Doug can launch his uh, his Mavic drone from. <clears throat> and here it is. Uh, he's getting ready to launch. And I took a number of these videos, and every time I photographed them, he never launched. Uh, so I, I'm going to play this one, and that's the. That's the noisy outboard, air-cooled uh, outboard motor in the background. And there's our target. That, that's Cooks and Bluff, and it goes for some distance. So we'll have, we'll have a lot more information on that later, uh, later in the um, presentation. Where, <clears throat> where Lake Tenkiller lies is in northeastern Oklahoma. It lies within the geologic province of the Ozark Uplift and it is surrounded by the Cherokee Platform and the Arcoma Basin, both of which are producing areas. The Ozark Uplift, at least in the Oklahoma portion, is not a producing province. In Arkansas, in North Arkansas, yes, the Fayetteville is, is, a, major, uh, is a major producer. But over here, uh, it's, it's not a producer, but there are reasons for that. And, and I'll show you exactly what those are and those reasons are in a second. Also, if you've been to, if you've been south of, let's say, Fayetteville in Arkansas along the interstate, you go through some fabulous Atoka cuts there and some steep mountains, and those are the Boston Mountains. So our area down here is actually the westward extension of those Arkansas Boston Mountains. Um, the general geology of Oklahoma and Lake Tenkiller area, again, I mentioned we're in the Ozark uplift, so meaning that you're going to have older rocks at the surface because the younger rocks have been stripped off. Uh, there's one other, and this is a very simplified map, obviously, uh, but the other feature that you'll notice is that there's a series of parallel or on echelon faults in here, and these are Ozark faults. They're not directly related to the Watchtower uplift, but they, we think that they're older faults associated with an old uplift uh, centered in the Ozarks in, in Missouri and Arkansas, but they were reactivated by the plate tectonics that formed the Wachita uh, fold belt down here. And I will show you, I will show you Ron Blakey's explanation of this too. Um, the, the rocks dip uh, west-southwest, uh, and of course they're, uh, they're distorted by this on echelon faulting. Um, in terms of age of rocks out here, uh, we range from uh, what's outcropping is the one outcrop of Silurian, but mostly Mississippian and lower Pennsylvanian uh, Morrowind age, Anatoka. <clears throat> so uh, the title of this is the Illinois River and Lake Tenkiller. And he here's the difference is that Lake Tenkiller is fed by the Illinois River, the, the Illinois River, not in Illinois. And, but its headwaters are up here in Washington County, Arkansas. And it is joined by a series of tributaries before it finally comes down. And it was impounded uh, down here, which I'll show you next, 
uh, at 10 Kilowatt Ferry Lake Dam. Uh, and after it leaves the, the the dam, it goes down here and does empty into the empties into the Arkansas River. So here's the dam, and it was quite a quite a project. It was built by the Army Corps of Engineers from 19 in, over a six year interval from 47 to 53. And like every Corps of Engineers project, it was for flood control, hydropower, water supply, and recreation. But when push comes to shove, it's flood control gets gets dibs on everything. Recreation kind of falls to the falls to the bottom of the pack, and I'll I'll, I'll explain that in a minute. Uh, it was named for the Ten Killer family. There were prominent Cherokees who owned the land uh, around the lake uh, and in the valley of uh, of the Illinois River. And uh, and a ferry which they operate and and the whole package was brought, was bought by the federal government. Uh, the lake itself is very scenic. It's surrounded by forested Ozark topography. Uh, it hosts bass and fishing tournaments and it, and it has many scuba diving attractions as you can tell by the lake here. And 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 actually the homestead of, of the Ten Killer family uh, is one of those is one of those dive sites. You can actually go in and see their own, see their own uh, properties, uh, their their house and barns and so forth. Also, they've done other things. They've done some kitschy things out here too, like putting helicopters and airliners and stuff out here in the lake for people to dive through as well. <clears throat> So geologists pay a lot of attention to lake level for good reason. And it's because high lake levels obscure good outcrops. And when the lake drops, that's when that's the that's the window of opportunity. That's that's when you want to go out. So I've I've highlighted three years here going back to 2019. And you can see 2019 had a huge flood in the spring, but then it never really, and we don't go into 2020 here, but it stayed flooded um, more or less for a year and it wiped out a lot of businesses. Marinas, marinas were uh, way up and unusable and it caused a, lot of, caused a lot of economic damage around the lake. This year, things have been pretty steady. And so it's not high, it's not low, but it's, it's good enough for what we're doing. In 2022, I did get out on my other watercraft, the Sea Dew, uh, which is able to go very quickly around the lake, and was able to get some low water pictures of section that you, you ordinarily wouldn't see. So here's the uh, he, here from Huffman is uh, the, the strat column for the area, and I want to point out a few things in this. Uh, here's our St. Clair formation, only present in the one island in, in the south of the lake. Most of what we're seeing out there is fault block related. And so these older ones, the Mississippian one, tend to be in upthrown fault blocks. Most of the rock, at least in the southern part of the lake, is a token. It's lower, it's lower Pennsylvanian in age. And um, uh, these do have equivalents in western Oklahoma. For instance, uh, this was mapped, the, the black shale, uh, which we would call Woodford, everywhere in Oklahoma was mapped as Chattanooga. And the only reason I can figure it was mapped as Chattanooga is because that's what Arkansas called it. And this is kind of close to Arkansas. So they adopted that terminology. Also, you'll notice that underneath the Chattanooga is this unit called the Silomore. And the Silomore is, if it was in Western Oklahoma, it would be the Meisner. So it is present out here. It's the same, same kind of configuration and same depositional system. Um, overlying the Chattanooga is the St. Joe group. And we think we have one outcrop with a little bit of bachelor shale in it, perhaps. And, and I did show you that slide earlier. Most of what we're going to be seeing in the bluffs are the Reed Spring, and we think the Keokuk, although these are actually, the Reed Spring has a certain rock character. It's thin bedded, uh, thin bedded chert and thin bedded uh, necritic limestone, whereas the Keokuk tends to be uh, recrystallized, uh, has a lot of uh, what I would call chat and possibly possibly tripolite uh, in it. And uh, it is, um, it, you can't see so much, you can't see bedding very well in it. Um, Moorfield, uh, we have one spot at Snake Creek that we're gonna take, very, Moorfield, Moorfield is very interesting. It's got phosphate and organic matter, it's radioactive. Um, it's it's uh, quite a bit different than, uh, than what is underlying it. And then uh, finally, the, uh, the Hale and Bloyd, which in one spot is faulted against 
the Osage uh, at Cooks and uh, Cooks and Bluff, and we'll show you a picture of that. And then the Atoka is great for it's just great for scenery. Uh, the Atoka is up to twenty thousand feet thick uh, in in the Wachita Mountains to the south. Uh, going even going over into the Boston Mountains in Arkansas, it's thousands of feet thick. Here it's not it's not so thick, uh, but it is quite scenic and quite interesting because there's a lot of um, uh, a, a lot of interesting uh, of deltaic um, uh, sands and shales exposed in it. Uh, Western Oklahoma, we do have equivalents. The Woodford is the Chattanooga. Uh, the Miss Lime is the Miss Lime is bigger than just the the Osage and the Keokuk and the Reed Springs. But um, uh, uh, over here, this is the portion of it that's represented in our section. There is a big unconformity at the top of the Osage in here, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. The Caney is um, kind of a play that's heating up in western Oklahoma, and uh, it's, it's equivalent, at least in part, the lower part of it is equivalent to the Moorfield. And then finally, the Goddard is, is um, I think, the equivalent of the Fayetteville. So this is a, from a, a really old publication, 48, uh, uh, by a paleontologist, Loudon. And I've drawn a box around here to kind of show you the section that we see at the lake. And Salina is, is north of the lake. Marble City is way off to the southeast. But this little window in here captures pretty well what's going on in terms of the, not sequence stratigraphy, but in terms of the bulk volume of rock uh, that's deposited. Uh, so again, uh, it doesn't go any deeper than the Chattanooga, but you can see this massive unconformity is developed on the top of the Keokuk here. And depending upon where you are, you could either be in, in, in Keokuk or Reed, Reed Springs, uh, but it, all, it, it is all of Osagean age. Also, it's all churdy as well. And uh, churdy is, uh, churdy is, churdy is a very controversial thing. Uh, it's, it, these are replacement churts. They're not peanut contemporaneous. Uh, you see evidence of fossils in them that have been replaced, and you know they're now molds instead of instead of being fossils. And peculiar things like in the Reed Springs, where you have bed by bed replacement, where you have a bed of limestone preserved, and then a bed of chert, and then a bed of limestone, and it repeats over and over again. So the problem with chert is, unlike a lot of things in geology, is finding a good recent and in this case subsurface analog for what's going on in in the formation of these charts. So I wanted to show this, and this is a. Um, I, I'm all, I'm not going to take you through every Blakey slide for the Paleozoic, but I did want to show a couple of them uh, just in in two time slices. And so this is kind of our key source rock um, unit in the petroleum source rock unit in the Midwest, uh, and well, not just the Midwest in North America. And it, you can see it's essentially the same formation, but it changes names around. So we're calling the Woodford over here, not Woodford, but we're calling it Chattanooga. And, but in Alabama, they call it Woodford. So uh, it's not, doesn't always exactly follow state lines. An equivalent section in the Illinois Basin is the New Albany, and in Michigan, it's the Antrim, in New York and Pennsylvania, it's the Huron, and Ohio, it's in West Virginia, it's the Ohio Shale. Uh, Southeast Arizona, it's the Percho, Bakken, Exshaw, Ge geological surveys are great at changing names on rocks that we all are, that we ought to be considering as a single depositional system. The other thing I wanted to point out on this is we've got two continents here. We've got Gondwana to the south and Laurasia to the north, and then we have a volcanic island arc out here, which suggests that there is plate collision going on. And yes, indeed, uh, when you crash Gondwana into North America, you uh, subduct beneath North America all of this material in between, and this is what happens. Uh, you have created mountains where there were no mountains. You've eliminated this um, this seaway, this Tethian seaway in here, and you've raised the Ozarks. You've created uh, the Wachita Mountains in the south. You've created the um, uh, the Western uh, Granitic Mountains in, in, in Oklahoma, the ancestral Rockies and so forth. So um, the, all of this, uh, the point that I'm trying to make is all of this had an effect on the patterns of deposition and erosion, even starting in the Mississippian and especially starting in the Mississippian, because even though you maybe weren't building these big Pennsylvanian age mountains, at that time, you were subducting and you were distorting the crust. And, and, and that had a lot to do with why you don't find Osage, for example, everywhere here. 
<clears throat> there is one aspect about uh, the Osage that you, you, you need to get, you, that you need to understand. And that is that the, the Cherry Osage is, is an aquifer and it's kind of centered here in southwestern Missouri, and, and it flows flows southwest. I guess is, is what I would describe. And it is a um, it, I, I don't know if it's totally confined or not, but you know the old principle about groundwater is ground water always flows downhill unless it's confined and under pressure, and then it then it can flow uphill. So there so there are a lot of springs down here on the on the very edge. Of, uh, of this aquifer system. And um, of course, the, the city of Tulsa uh, built a 60 mile pipeline. Uh, they, they capture this spring water, this very high quality spring water out here. And it's impounded in Yucca and Hudson reservoirs. And, they, and then they built these long pipelines to go to Tulsa. And uh, you would understand this if you uh, if you had seen a water quality analysis on the uh, on the Arkansas River that goes through Tulsa, it's not that it's murky or dirty or anything like that. It's just that it drains a basin that's full of evaporites, and the water quality is not is not very high. So this is uh, this is more like bottled water out here. <clears throat> So here's um, uh, here's a stark reminder of we may not be dealing exactly with a petroleum province in this area. And even though we have uh, bukus of production over here on the Cherokee platform around Muskogee, uh, the Arcoma Basin to the south, very few wells, I could find no commercial seismic out here. And especially to the north, uh, this appears to be within the Osage Aquifer. In fact, this well noted that drilled to 1,500 feet, there was fresh water to total depth. Now, I don't think that means every formation was full of fresh water, but um, certainly the Osage would be expected to be. Some of these, uh, some of these, uh, oops, let me go back here. <clears throat> Some of these points are, are specious data. Uh, they're mislocated gas wells that belong in another county. So there, no, there are no gas wells completions out here um, that at least of recent record. And then some of these, uh, some of these ones that say no record, um, uh, they get in the Oklahoma Co Corporation Commission database, but then when they go out to try to find them, they find they look for them, they don't find them, and then they write up a little affidavit that says there's no record of the well. Down to the south here, however, <clears throat> uh, a couple of deep wells that were drilled and got found oil shows. And there is one well down here that has a well log. I cut it out of the presentation for the sake of, uh, just for the sake of brevity, uh, but it TD is in the Cambrian. And uh, interestingly enough, as I'll explain to you, there is no Osage down here at the, down at the Southern end of the lake. And this well, uh, the well logs show that very, uh, very explicitly. So we mentioned faults before, and there are, actually three major faults that are going to be of interest to us. The North Cookson Fault, uh, the South Cookson Fault, and then the Black Gum Fault. And so most of the most of the localities, and I've, I've highlighted our areas of interest down here, Strayhorn Island for the Atoka, Snake Creek for a number of different things, and then the Cookson and Pettit stuff up north is primarily Mississippi and primarily, primarily Osage, uh, except this one little fault cut that we see here at, um, at, at Cookson Bluff. So I kind of beat the drum about Cookson Bluff and it is the, the most scenic Osage Bluff out here. Uh, this is taken wide angle from some distance away. And my little blue stars on there. I have a, uh, I, I have a plug-in in my GIS program that allows me to import all my geotagged photographs and then put a dot on the map and then link that dot back to the picture. So it's a very, very handy tool for organizing your data. Um, anyway, uh, this is all pretty much, uh, well, either one or two formations. It's all Osagian for the most part. There's a little bit of um, uh, a little bit of Hinesville up here that's been mapped at the top. And most of this is this MKR, which is MKR is Keokuk Reed Springs. Now Keokuk is not a, is uh, other workers who are working around this area today are probably not using the word Keokuk. They've subdivided it. Um, they probably put in Burlington or, or, or something else. Uh, Reed Springs is a name that has stuck here. And Reed Springs is pretty identifiable, as I'll show you. The maximum height of this bluff is about 80 feet. 
And here's our first drone panorama. So let me play it. So we did, we did get airborne. And that gives you an idea of the extent of, uh, in fact, that isn't the whole bluff. Let me, let me go back here. There's more, there's more a section off to the south here, off to the left-hand side. So let me, let me go forward and show you this. This is kind of the first thing that got our attention in here. What's going on? You've got gray kind of thin bedded uh, rock down here, which we later identified as Reed Springs. And so it's thin bedded shirt and thin bedded lime. And then you've got, this is not a, not a perfect outcrop because it's got a lot of talus and it's got a lot of vegetation on it. And I did go out in winter to try to get better pictures, but eh, there's a lot of cedar here too, which is evergreen. This is what something that got our attention. And it's this um, different colored rock up here. And if you look at it, there is some kind of vague cross bedding in this. And then this stuff looks kind of punky or chalky. And all the black stuff here is, um, is, is uh, lichen. And then there's stuff that looks like draperies on it. And so we did zoom in on this, but I actually got a much better shot close into this zone on the lake. And uh, this is the, um, oops. This is the interpretation um, that we put on it. And I say apparent chat because with that, we actually haven't taken a sample of it. Um, it would require repelling to get up here, but it certainly looks like chat. And what chat is, is, is interbedded um, uh, chert and limestone where, where water has um, removed, uh, dissolved the carbonate component and left this kind of brecciated or unbedded uh, appearing rock. Uh, it's rubbly, it's, it's, it's brecciated and so forth. And so as this was originally mapped in the area, this is what Huffman would have called Keokuk formation. And um, this apparent tripolite is always the softest unit. It always forms this kind of concave surface, whereas the more stout stuff and the more brecciated stuff is the chat. And then down below, of course, is our, is our Reed Springs. So this recent paper, and this is from Osage County off to the Northwest, um, there's a lot of uh, chat and tripolite in Osage County. It's uh, the papers by Aboba and Liner. And uh, I mentioned how chat is formed. It's, it's formed by the dissolution of carbonate in interbedded rocks. And then, but then tripolite is a different, kind of a different creature. It's, it's caused by the recrystallization of chert like fluids. And it causes, again, the obliteration of fabric, but it makes a real high, um, or can make a real high kind of chalky matrix porosity, high porosity and, and lower permeability. Like most things in geology, there is more than one cause. Uh, th there are more than one ways to explain how something can form. And so chat and chert, can it's always formed by alteration by water, but the water can be from above or it can be from below. And the water from above is fresh water. It's a, fr it's a fresh water uh, system, an unconfined aquifer, or just a cat, maybe a cavern system even. Uh, the other source of water is hydroth hydrothermal fluids, and these are carried by deep faults. And in this area, in Osage County, we have lots of other evidence that the chat and the chert up here are a product of hydrothermal alteration. Out here at the lake, we have none of that evidence, um, but we're not finished looking either. And that was one of my, when, I, when we figured out that this was probably tripolite, the question was, is it karst or is it hydrothermal? And um, I'll, I'll show you some of, the, some of the evidence here in a minute. <clears throat> um, Things have happened uh, in the geological world since Huffman uh, did his work. And one of them is seek stratigraphy. And uh, this was a fairly recent uh, uh, group of scientists, uh, Mazzello et al, uh, in a paper from 2019, in which uh, they have kind of modern, they've kind of modernized the stratigraphy in here. And I've drawn a box around what my guess is as to what we're looking at at the lake. And so the Pineville member is their, um, it is their um, big prominent uh, triple light chat uh, interval within the upper Reed Springs. 
But again, big unconformity at the top of the reed springs, and it's that unconformity which, for a uh, for a karst-driven system, is possibly uh, the reason, or, or is possibly the agent by which uh, that acts on, or or that forms uh, forms chert and chat. Now, putting this in a sequence stratigraphy um, uh, paradigm. There's been a lot of interest in the Mississippian, primarily because of the mislime play in western Oklahoma, in western Oklahoma, uh, the, the northern extension of the Anadarko Basin and, uh, and into southern Kansas. But there aren't any Mississippian outcrops in, in western Oklahoma or southern Kansas. The closest place to find a depositional model to um, uh, to the mislime, at least the Osagian part of the mislime in the subsurface, uh, or and Kinderhook as well over here, is uh, is in outcrops in, in southwestern Missouri, southeastern Kansas, Oklahoma, and, and Arkansas. And so from this paper, um, I like this little cartoon. Uh, shows the three uh, the, 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 the the three uh, mega clinoforms uh, that prograded southwest. And here we are, the star is our like 10 killer out here. It's at the very edge of T3. Now, there's more to this though, because as you remember, we're not really in deep water facies out here. We're not at the, we're not at the toe of, a, of, a, of the T3 clinoform. We're more like here, and then we've been eroded off. The, the last part of this T3 is not the natural extension of the clinoform, but it's the erosional ed edge of one. So here's a here's another drone view of our section out here, and because of all this vegetation out here, it's hard to get a good vertical section. And again, this is a this is a job for um, well, it's a job for a couple of things: uh, more detailed drone work. Uh, we could also drop a, drop a, 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 a scintillometer uh, from the top. Somebody who's brave can stand up there and drop a scintillator, and we could get a gamma ray curve on here. Getting samples is going to be more difficult, and that that would require uh, that would require repelling unfortunately, and I'm, I'm too old for that at this point. So our reed springs, here's typical reed springs. It's kind of what you see uh, also every place else in northeastern Oklahoma, uh, up in Tulsa, there's, uh, or, or in uh, Tahlequah, about 12 miles north, there's very good reed springs, uh, bluffs exposed. In fact, there's a very nice section up there that, uh, that Mazzolo et al. Um, uh, included in their report. And uh, I, I love the Reed Springs. Here's some more pictures of it. Uh, it's, uh, you can see these blocks have kind of come loose and they've, and they've rotated a bit. But look at this. This, is, this, this kind of looks like cross bedding in here. And um, it's a bit, maybe Doug has an explanation for it, but it's always hard for me to explain cross bedding in muddy rocks. I always think of cross bedding as something that's, it's a gravity effect that, uh, that is from a sand pile rather than, uh, rather than mud. But I'm, I'm open to suggestion. Clinoforms. Um, th this is a. This struck me as being very odd. You've got clinoforms uh, tilted to the south here, and then you've got coming back at it in the opposite direction more clinoforms, but uh, in in forming kind of a chevron. And I uh, maybe somebody who knows more about these has has an opinion. I I don't have an opinion about what depositional setting could cause these, but uh, I just be I just be speculating. Our Reed Springs chert um, is often full of, it can be very porous. And here, for example, here's the chert, and these are replacement cherts. It's a replacement of coral, and it's left where the coralites were, it's left with, with uh, bugs and bugs and molds. Uh, the rest of it can be, can be fairly dense. Uh, if the rock is fairly grainy, uh, especially crinoid, echinodermal material, uh, you'll get a lot of, a lot of molds of, of crinoid stems in it. At the very south end of Cookson Bluff <clears throat> is a fault. And I always thought this fault was the South Cookson Fault until I overlaid um, the OGS layer on there, which fell kind of right in the middle, interestingly enough. And uh, I noticed that there is a fault to the south. And that actually is probably the South Cookson Fault. This is a doesn't seem to go anywhere off in the western direction, but this seems to be a secondary fault. But there's a lot of throw on it. Uh, this is Lower Mississippi, and this is Lower Pennsylvania. And so most of these major faults that cut through the lake are at least 300 feet of throw. Uh, some of them, some of them more than that. 
When you go up close and look at the fault plane surface behind them, it's textbook. This is fault gouge, and this is the uh, you know the this is the ground up uh, portion of the Osage uh, that is trapped between moving uh, moving slabs of rock. Uh, I did make a second trip out here because I'm always looking for hydrocarbons, and I thought, well, maybe there's a maybe there's a um, an oil seep along this fault. But sure enough, uh, no uh, no dice. I mean, it is dark, but it's not it's not hydrocarbon you're looking at. Um, on the Pennsylvania side, there's some interesting rock, and here's a here's a fellow uh, with his with his nose to the rock looking at this. And this is kind of an unusual for, for an echinodermal limestone. Uh, it's instead of uh, stems, instead of crinoid stems, which are very common in the Pennsylvanian and the Mississippian, um, they're actually plates. And so this is a deposit of these plates from the calyx of this uh, Athelocrinus um, beast that you see here uh, in a much better state of preservation. So we're going to go up north from uh, Cook, or we're going to actually go, go across the channel to Cooks and Bend and look at one one feature over here. Uh, this fault here, I, I think this is Cooks and Bend fault, and it actually wraps around, comes up here, and then there is a a, a closure against this fault, kind of a structure, kind of what kind of what we, um, uh, although um, not the kind of structure we're looking for. And um, so let me show you the picture of that. And what you see at water level is more chat again. So chat, we would think not read springs, probably we think uh, more like the more like the Keokuk, and then an unconformity at the top, and then over that is this Hinesville, which is um, uh, which is Mississippian, and the, the Hinesville is um, is Chesterian in age. But it incorporates layers in here. You'll notice these are short, well, they're almost boulders. I mean, they're cobbles. They're very angular. Uh, and uh, there's a couple of layers of them. So this unconformity keeps popping up all, all around the lake. And it's different in different places. In fact, the nature of these lag beds is different in different places. Interestingly, we don't have what we see in some other places, a transgressive surface of erosion with, uh, with a lot of phosphatic material. This, this seems to be simply, simply detrital stuff up here. Um, South Pettit uh, is, we've, uh, we've crossed, the, we've gone north from where we were. We, we were down here before. We've gone north up here, and um, <clears throat> you'll notice that uh, these are points that I shot from my camera by just off the bluffs here. And you'll notice that the lowest map formation here is Hinesville. What I was photographing is Osage. And for some reason, uh, in places, the map is incomplete. For example, this is Goose Island up here, it has wonderful outcrops. Uh, but it, it wasn't mapped. Uh, this is bedrock here, wasn't mapped. And this slice in here, which is all, which is all Osage, wasn't mapped as well. So, so anyway, I'm not, I'm not complaining. I'm just pointing it out that somebody forgot to put a formation on here that should have been on here. Also, there are peculiarities about here, uh, about this, is most of what's exposed along here is hail bloid, but yet it's got, it's mapped way down into the lake. Now that could be uh, that it was mapped at a time that lake level was much lower, but obviously that didn't that didn't help them out here or here. Um, there's interesting features in here as well. Uh, in this Osage, we've got bedded Osage up here. We've got uh, ch chatty looking stuff. Uh, we've got bedded stuff that seems to tur turn to chat, and then we've got a pocket back here that I, that I would at a distance I would call it tripolite. Uh, here's a here's a kind of a side view, and and there's your chat. It's the 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 the, the ground up brecciated collapsed fabric of rock, uh, with more structured rocks overlying it, draped over it. There's what we think is tripolite. So I went up and I had a really close look at the tripolite, and this explains a lot. Uh, remember, I said it was kind of looked like draperies along uh, Cookson Bluff. Well, here's the draperies, and I didn't need the sample list to know what it was. It's dripstone. It's what you find inside of a cave. Now, the question is, <clears throat> this is tripolite, we think, and it's got dripstone covering the surface of it. So is this dripstone Holocene 
uh, because we are at almost at the surface here, or is it is it Mississippian? Is it related to that Osage unconformity? And that's where we need some good geochemistry out here to be able to to, to be able to put some dates on these um, events uh, to to truly figure out what's going on. And at Bay, I have one slide. Uh, and uh, this is just an example of a, uh, here we were at South Pettit, Pettit Bay is up here. Uh, here's my one slide from Pettit Bay. And uh, lo and behold, there's a, there's a little, uh, little normal fault in here uh, in the chat. Uh, this chat is very, very messy looking rock. We're gonna go south <clears throat> to the south half of the reservoir where most of, the, most of the country rock out here is a toka, except where the older rocks are exposed by upthrown fault blocks. And the, the fault block of interest here is the black gum fault. And there are three features out here, only two of which I'm gonna show you. Uh, there's this island out here, <laughs> which again, wasn't mapped, uh, doesn't appear as a geologic formation. And then this one, this feature, which was mapped, and it's, um, uh, it's a, um, um, uh, not a, uh, well, what's the word I'm trying to think of? It's it closed against the fault, but it's, but it's a syncline against the fault is the way I would describe it. Um, <clears throat> so let's go to the next slide here. So remember that little island I showed you? Well, I've christened this Woodford Island, and it's because it's a spectacular uh, outcrop of Woodford that is capped by either weather, weathered Woodford and Osage on top of it, or uh, the Bachelor Formation. We're not we're not sure. We don't have any uh, we don't have any conodonts to tell us whether this is Kinderhook age up, up here or not. Whether there's an unconformity. Now Doug did do some, uh, and, and there's another uh, another picture of it taken from low water, and you can see it's a good uh, you know maybe a good 15 20 feet thick with the Osage sitting on top of it. Now here's Doug is trying to figure this thing out about this St. Joe or Bachelor or whether Woodford stuff on the top. And he's digging around. He's looking for he's looking for pebble lags at, at this interface, and um, unfortunately didn't didn't find any. So the jury is still out as to what this what this formation is. But interestingly, it doesn't show up anyplace else in the lake. Also, the character of the Cherty Osage is there's no there's no chat uh, there's no tripolite. So we think this is probably Reed Springs up here, uh, and it contains um, it contains both detrital chert. Um, pieces, hunks, and, and also in place uh, chert, uh, replacement chert as well. So I, uh, I, I'm a former geochemist of sorts, and uh, I was interested in the Osage, the, the Chattanooga, and I ran pyrolysis on a sample out here. And what it told us, and I won't get too deeply into this, it's a TOC, total organic carbon of about 2.5%, which is kind of low by Woodford standards. Uh, you can tell by this huge S1 spike that it has a high bitumen content and also this shoulder that forms on the S2, the carriagen peak. And um, so, so this, or this rock is lousy with, with bitumen. Um, and um, of course, the bitumen tends to suppress this S2, so you don't really know what the uh, RO equivalent is. But just using the data as it is without extracting the sample or anything, we get about a, a 0.63 in the old uh, uh, in, in the old calculation of, uh, of RO equivalents. There are at the lake other known source rocks, and I'll mention a bit about those later. Uh, there's the Atoka, uh, which has in the shales has some pretty good source rock shales. There's the Fayetteville, which is a producing shale over in Arkansas, and then of course the Moorfield, uh, which we'll show you uh, show you here in a second. An another feature, it's uh, Snake Creek. So at Snake Creek Campground, here was our little island. See, it's, it's kind of disappeared off this map, but Snake Creek Island on the on the other side of this inlet here is a, uh, and there is some structure in here. There's a, there's a syncline and you see rollovers and stuff in here. So there's, there's a fair amount of flexure and it's, and it's related to this, uh, uh, related to this Southwest Northeast trending fall. And so let's take a closer look at that. This stuff is, uh, it's, we were both fascinated by this, this rock. This is Moorfield and it sits unconformably on the Osage underneath it. And you wouldn't know that the unconformity was there unless you take a boat and get out some distance from the shore and then you see the, the churdy rocks on the unconformity surface underneath it. 
Um, Doug is looking at um, a, a section here where there's a lot of it. You see the, the very pronounced uh, Swaley Channel Basin here. These are, these are pods of sandstone in here that's in with carbonate sand. It's interfig interfiguring with carbonate sand. And then there's, there's a fair amount. There's unconformities within this. And then there's a, a fair amount of soft sediment deformation as well. <clears throat> the other thing that you pick up on here is, since we love transgressive surfaces of erosion from rising sea level, there are two layers in here. There's one at the top and there's one down here. Uh, the one down here, let me go over to the right first, is uh, pebbly. And they're all, the pebbles are all kind of a, a, kind of a certain size, about, a, about an inch in diameter. They're not perfectly rounded. And uh, that's, my, that's my little portable scintillator scintillometer here, which measures gamma radiation. And one of the telltale things about phosphate is that, it, it, in my experience, it's always radioactive. And so if you can't identify a rock and you're looking to narrow it down, you might think these are, in fact, when I first looked at the app, I said, those are just chert pebbles. No, they're not. They're radioactive, and chert isn't ordinarily radioactive. Plus, they're softer than chert, and they, they have other characteristics of, of phosphate. So um, the, upper, the upper bed on top of this, the uh, interpretation, the transgressive surface of erosion, is full of these big cobbles and gravelly looking stuff. And then below it's, it's almost kind of, a, kind of a bimodally sorted deposit. So let's skip down to the far south end of the lake and get a couple of tourist shots here. Uh, this is the island that has some uh, Silurian on the north side, uh, but most of it is a token. And uh, the Atokan gets more and more spectacular. Um, well, it's actually pretty good in the north end of the lake, so I can't make that generalization about it. But the sands do tend to form bluffs. And here's a bluff that is right across from Snake Creek that I thought was kind of interesting. And geologists are always, we think of caves as being associated with limestone because it dissolves and it's in karst systems, groundwater systems. So how do these caves form? Um, the only explanation that I came up with is uh, differential erosion, and it's either a property of how the, how the dissolving fluids are acting on the rocks or the rock. Uh, it could just be that cementation of the grains is not uniform across this and that there are pockets of, of looser sand uh, with, within the Atoka. Uh, here's a, you may recognize Lisa Gang rings. Those are also found occasionally in the Atoka. Uh, 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 hypothetical explanations as to how they how they form. Uh, they're not organic. Uh, picking out crops, and um, uh, this is um, just across from Black Gum. Uh, there's also Fayette, good Fayetteville outcrops over here, which I, I misplaced my picture. I would show that if I had it. Uh, every formation out here has fossils. Almost every, well, every formation does. And uh, it's everything from vertebrate material like this uh, Physonema spine. You know, sharks don't have, uh, th they don't have mineralized skeletons except for their teeth. And they have some fins that, that have um, phosphatic uh, min mineralized uh, fins as well. But the skeletons themselves don't preserve. So this is uh, oftentimes with Pennsylvania sharks, this is about all we know about the shark is, is the hard part that happened to preserve. Petromides rusticus is, um, if you've ever collected blastoids, blastoids in the, in, in the Mississippian are fairly common. Blastoids in the uh, Hale Bloid, which is lower Pennsylvania, are very rare. Not in that formation, but worldwide, um, this is almost the last gasp of, the, uh, uh, of, of blastoid echinoderms. Asterosoma, uh, looking at it, you might think it's a, a sea urchin or a kinoderm or something. The latest explanation of these is that these are these are polychaete worms, uh, but uh, I'll and I'll I'll take that at face value that a polychaete worm could build this radial structure. Uh, I thought this bryozoan frond was interesting just because it is so delicate. And of course, you can see all the cracks running through it. I wasn't able to to, uh, to collect it intact. In the Atoka, um, the Atoka is generally not terribly fossiliferous, uh, according to Huffman, but it's lousy with trace fossils. And one of the fossils, one of the, one of the most abundant fossils is zoophycus, which is a surface, um, it reflects surface activity moving back and forth, probably a feeding trail of some sort, um, probably not a trilobite, probably something that didn't preserve as, as a fossil, uh, but they are, they are quite abundant. 
So I'm going to turn it over to Doug now, and he's going to uh, explain more about the uh, finer points of drone geology and photography. All right, uh, uh, John, just uh, just a few words about the uh, the use of the drone for uh, aerial photography. Uh, in the upper left there, you see the John's Whaley, and then there's the uh, the drone, quite compact in in, in uh, size, uh, such that you can fold it up and put it in a backpack and trek off across the countryside. What you also see are the red pontoons uh, on the bottom of the drone. And of course, being out on the lake, it's quite necessary. You can launch it from the water or during high wave activity, as John alluded to before, we can launch it from the front of the uh, front of the vessel. Uh, it has a 4K camera, which is quite ultra high definition, which allows us to get some of these great shots that you see. Uh, the uh, the drone is connected to uh, radio uh, radio connected, of course, to a controller that is attached to. I have an iPad Mini, but you can use an Android or a uh, an iPhone, and uh, that will do too. Um, we carry three batteries. Each battery is about 30 minutes. So we can get 90 minutes, which is quite a bit of time when you're out there uh, doing your aerial survey. Um, here I show the sequence uh, from the upper right to the lower left and the lower right of the same area of the, uh, of the Osage outcrop at, at Cooksman Bluff. And uh, you can see as we can get closer and closer and closer, the, the bottom uh, right is the oblique shot. So we can, we can scale ourselves to, uh, to whatever uh, visual uh, uh, visualization that we want to see. So it's quite nice. And you can also see our our red boat in the upper right uh, for scale. And you can imagine that if we did have a, a, a logging truck, we could probably uh, throw a, a, a sand over the side of the cliff, much like we did at ARCO back in the 90s at Big Rock Quarry, Roger Slatt, myself, and some ARCO colleagues. And uh, we're just waiting for that opportunity to find a, uh, a day where there's a logging truck in the area, uh, which might be able to accommodate us. Okay, John, next. So uh, with the drone, you can get uh, shots at right angles, which allow you to, to really see the, the correct length, the width, the orientation, the geometry of these features. As John alluded to before, I believe on the left, we have these large sand waves. I think Robert Hanford in the chat mentioned they probably sediment drift, and I agree with him. I can see wedging and thinning of the strata down dip uh, with the yellow arrows that you see coming up from, from, the, from the bottom. Uh, there's chaotic beds, uh, interbedded with layered beds. Um, it's, uh, it's quite spectacular when you can get right on, right on the outcrop in a, in a horizontal view. Uh, on the uh, on the right, you'll see what I've interpreted to be erosional surfaces. Now, granted, they could be something to do with uh, with the karstine that John mentioned, the draping, uh, the the dripstone. Uh, but there does seem to be these surfaces that one can one can uh, carry across the outcrop. And uh, how you interpret those? Well, we're open to uh, interpretations. Next. So again, you can get as uh, uh, a detailed views as you want. You can you can you can uh, get right up against the outcrop. The the drone has a uh, uh, an obstacle sensor warning so that you do if you do get too close, it it beeps you loudly and it'll actually stop. You can set it to it stops within twenty feet, ten feet of the outcrop. So I would recommend it being about twenty feet myself. Um, so again, you can see the uh, the apparent clinoforms, again, the, uh, the dipping from right to left. And again, these are probably some type of a sediment drift or a, a large, large sand wave, if you will. John, next. Okay, very briefly a mention of, of the drone photography, but here are some things to remember. You, you must register your drone. You have to take that uh, recreational uh, safety test administered by the FAA and uh, you always keep that paperwork with you. You actually uh, assign, they're assigned, uh, assign you a number that you put on the drone itself, like a, a tail number would be on, a, on an aircraft. Always put that and carry your, carry your paperwork. And you must always keep the drone in the line of sight. Okay, these drones can go up. I've seen it on, on the YouTube. They go up to four or four and a half miles out in the desert uh, in clear sight. But I would not recommend going much further and uh, you know a mile or two out where you can see the actual drone. 
And you have to be aware of the flight restrictions due to nearby air traffic or airports. And these are shown on a map on your display. In the lower left-hand corner, there's a map view as well as the view of the, uh, the outcrop or the scenery that you're, you're observing. Uh, you're limited to 400 feet vertically above ground depth, 122 meters. Anything higher than that, you're going to uh, get in a bit of a trouble. And uh, you can get higher than that if you have a, uh, a, a license that's a uh, basically a commercial license. So you can get a commercial license, but there's a whole bunch of restrictions that you have to administer and be administered to. And it costs you quite a bit more money to acquire a license. Now, some locations like state parks may require permission. And we did get permission to uh, to do our work out here on the lake. And the only uh, comment that was made by the person at the Corps of Engineers office was that we stay away from the dam, which is a pretty good idea to do. So get your permissions and, uh, and you'll be okay. And you can get um, more of the... Uh, uh, restrictions and rules uh, on, on Google. And uh, these are just kind of the major ones that uh, I wanted to bring up. Hey, John. Okay. <clears throat> so I just wanted to leave you with this. Uh, even though there's few wells, and as far as I know, no seismic, uh, at least no commercially available seismic in my brief search, uh, it doesn't mean that there's no fire department potential out here. There are source rocks. And uh, we have Woodford, Moorfield, Fayetteville, and Atoka. And where you get a source rock close to the surface and you get bacterial um, degradation of the source rocks, you have the potential for an antrum shale, like in Michigan. Now, is there an antrum shale hiding out here? Well, the odds aren't very good, but <clears throat> it, is, uh, it is something that you could do in an area that otherwise might seem impossible for, for finding hydrocarbons. Um, the more conventional play that, that I can think of that's out here is the, from the Woodford or the Chattanooga expelled into this underlying Silomore sandstone. And this is assuming that the Silomore is discontinuous and it's not swept as part of the aquifer um, but that probably more than anything has the potential for structural and stratigraphic traps. And as I mentioned, the Meisner sand in Western Oklahoma is it's all part of the same siliciclastic system. And then all these major faults with the hundreds of feet of throw, um, if you can get a positive closure on one of these faults and preferably deeper, uh, you know, out in an area where you have a toka at the surface rather than the Mississippian, um, that is, uh, that is uh, uh, something that's worth looking at. Also, north end of the, north end of the reservoir, uh, just lower probability of success because of the fresh water. South end uh, shows and some potential down there. <clears throat> so I'd like to thank uh, all of it. The, the, the the interest, especially in the in the Mississippian, has been driven in large part by the success uh, of the Miss Lime play in Western Oklahoma, and so these outcrops and their great outcrops have been studied by uh, workers from Kansas, Missouri, uh, Oklahoma. Um, uh, Robert Hanford, I guess, who's in Alabama now. And uh, th th there has been a, a, a lot of interest directed towards them. So uh, we appreciate all of that work that's been done. Uh, from what we see out at the lake, there's more work that needs to be done, at least as far as the geologic history of Holocene or Pennsylvania cars. We, we don't know. Uh, well, well, we can't prove it. Let's put it that way. So um, <clears throat> Huffman enlisted, as I mentioned, many graduate students to do this work. The University of Arkansas does a number of theses over in Oklahoma. And um, we'd, like to, we'd like to invite anybody who would like to work over here to, uh, to, to come over here and get familiar with it and get interested in it, because it is quite interesting. I, I use, uh, for this uh, exercise, I use mapping, georeferencing, and spatial analysis in my favorite GIS program, QGIS. And um, with that, uh, We'll uh, we'll open it up for questions. Thank you. That was amazing. <laughs> I like those caps. 
And they both like look like they have some history there. So uh, let me see here. It, Susan, do you want to read the chat questions or do you want me to, to, to scroll through and read them? Really didn't get questions. We had a few comments uh, from Robert right. um, yeah. that I addressed about the sediment drift and about the pronunciation of the Sillamore, perhaps, not the Sillamore. Oh, yes, it's, uh, yeah, I don't know how to pronounce it. This <laughs> rhymes with Sycamore. <laughs> yeah, question for Doug? Yeah. I think. <laughs> uh, what's the vintage of the two wells that had oil shows? Oh, that's John. Go ahead, John. Um, hmm. I, I I don't want to misspeak on it. The one that has the well log was drilled in 1970, and it has a density neutron log with it. And that's I did buy that log. Um, the other two I'm going to say are are older, perhaps 40s or 50s vintage, uh, okay. because the information that you get on them is often drilling reports, and there were, there were no well logs as, with those. Was there information on the gravity of the oil? No, it was just noted. Uh, it was just the driller's log that noted, you know, ah. show, show of oil, and then they don't describe it in any detail at all. Okay, thank you. Now, the documents, if you're curious, um, go to the, uh, uh, there's two sources for well data in Oklahoma. One is through the survey, and they have a portal. And then uh, the Corporation Commission has a portal and um, oftentimes, if you're looking for documents, uh, the Corporation Commission has some, they have documents that the survey doesn't, doesn't have. That's a good point. And also, if somebody is looking for well logs, um, I recommend going to the Oklahoma Well Log Library in Tulsa. <laughs> and also, the, the mid, um, the continent log library in Oklahoma City. And then there are cores. Um, now, one question that came to my mind, okay, so you talked about the Mississippi and outcrops and, and I've done field work in that, in, like in Arkansas. And then I was just wondering how the different, how the Mississippian is, different there than say in the um, outcrops in the Arbuckles. In the, in the Arbuckles. Versus the outcrops that you are seeing um, in the, in Ten Killer. Um, are, are you sure you mean the Arbuckles? Yeah, there's Mississippi and outcrops in the Arbuckles. Oh, okay. Then I, I I don't I don't know maybe somebody who works the Ar uh, the uh, Ardmore Basin or Ar uh, uh, Ardmore Basin would know. Yeah, they're in the Dalisi Quarry. <laughs> so anyway, they, yeah, there's a um, I, I'd say in general there's a much uh, fuller, better developed Mississippian section in the um, <clears throat> in the Anadarko Basin than there is over here. One of the questions that I always had about the Miss Lime play is why isn't there a Miss Lime play in eastern Oklahoma? Because the source rocks are there. There is mm -hmm. some Osage rock here. Well, I think I kind of answered it in, in, in its own way in doing this exercise because the Osage, which are the dominant carrier beds for hydrocarbons from the Woodford, are, are roaded away. Over here, mm -hmm. uh, as you get close to the close to the kitchen, close to the close to the Arcoma Basin, and so you don't have this nice continuous pathway for hydrocarbons to move from the uh, from the Woodford into the lowest um, carrier bed and then up dip. Uh, it's it's interrupted by by erosion. So uh, and Osage County is its own thing. And uh, I'll talk about this at a talk I'm gonna give in October for mid-continent section, but Osage has its own kitchen. And so some of the oils, the big oil fields that you see in Northeastern Oklahoma are probably from that local kitchen, a hydrothermal kitchen uh, mm -hmm. in Osage County, rather than uh, being long distance migrated from, the, from the, uh, either the uh, Arcoma Basin or the uh, Anadarko Basin. I totally agree with you because I mean you see migration pathways kind of terminating 
uh, and there, and especially along the erosion along conformities. But then, like you said, in the and you get closer to the, and a lot of people have done a lot of work on this, which is exciting. But the um, Mississippi Valley type of um, um, hydrothermal activity and the Mississippi type Valley types of uh, mineralization. So you do have, like you said, a kitchen with like lots of hydrothermal activity over the years, over the. Yeah, the closest, so, the closest documented hydrothermal we have to here is the tri-state district, mm -hmm. uh, which yes. is um, southwestern Missouri, northeastern uh, uh, Oklahoma, northwest Arkansas. And um, <clears throat> there are some, uh, well, uh, yeah, I'll just, I'll just kind of leave it at that. That's some distance from here. And um, mm -hmm. you always suspect with hydrothermal systems that there's basement fault and faulting involved because that's where you get mineral rich warm waters that come up and alter alter rocks and deposit uh, metallic minerals. Super interesting. Yeah, just like um, all sorts of things happening, but like heat flow, that's cool. Any other questions from anybody? Question? Like open up your mic. Oh, go ahead, Dennis. Um, first and foremost, John and Doug, thank you for a really interesting talk and certainly um, a talk that's um, unusual, but I uh, hope you have some more in the future uh, like this. Um, and then my question is, um, are you open to leading a lake trip for students? John, go ahead. <laughs> Not this year, um, but maybe next year. Um, I, I've thought of the idea of running for TGS of running a trip. Of course, it would require a pontoon boat and um, a lot of planning to pull it off. People, we have done TGS has done lake trips before. Uh, so the short answer is I'm I'm open to the idea. Um, why don't you uh, Why don't you email me and let me know. Uh, what you have in mind for uh, for a field trip out here? Mm -hmm. Thank you, John. Is, um, I, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll express my bias here. Uh, I, I have two. I have a sea view, and then I have this Whaley boat, and I use them for geological exploration. And I've done most of the big lakes in Oklahoma, and plus a number of them in Texas. And to me, Ten Killer is <laughs> it's the most interesting because it's got everything. It's got structure. Uh, it's yeah. got a lot of section exposed. It's not just one. It's not just all Cretaceous like a Texas lake or um, even uh, even in western Oklahoma, a Kaw Reservoir is all Pennsylvanian and, and a little bit of Permian. But uh, this is um, uh, this is a, a natural. This lake is a natural laboratory of a diverse geologic setting. Mm -hmm. Sure. All right, go. There was a question, John. Uh, yeah. What are the dips on the faults in the Ten Killer area? Hmm. What was that? The, what are the dips on the faults in the Ten Killer area? You showed the oh. water fault uh, with the hail up against the Reed Springs on the surface. Yeah. That appeared to be 30, 40 degree dip, possibly on that fault. Yeah, that's yeah, that's right. And they do um, that one. That one does kind of does kind of flatten out too. Uh, the the geologic map, the Huffman map, has dips has dip and strike marked on them. They did take where, like I say, they didn't use boats for the most part, but where they could get to something on land, apparently they could get to this South Cooks and Fault. In fact, it was Huffman's group that I believe named the South the South Cooks and Fault. So uh, they they do have uh, where they took strike and dip measurements are marked are marked on the map, uh, and and yes. Um, you look at South Island, the Atoka, that's dipping, uh, I don't know, 15, 10, 15 degrees, something like that. But uh, along the fault scarp, the, the dip is often much steeper. Okay. And then what was the lithology color and texture of the St. Clair formation? Mm. Um, I, I would have to, uh, the, the, bless, the best place is since I haven't, um, Examine the the St. Clair. Uh, you know, I, I I didn't get off at South Island, so that's that's my excuse, and I don't have firsthand knowledge of this. But in Bulletin 77 on the 10 killer map, uh, they have a very good description, and also in Bulletin 77 they have a description of what the what the color and composition of the of the St. Clair is. 
There is a there is an area. Um, <clears throat> uh, this operator that drilled the deep well southeast of uh, southeast of the lake, uh, they called the uh, Saluro Devonian section Hunton, and I think that the Hunton as a group does does include the Silurian as well. This, the Silurian is is actually much better exposed, just a little bit to the east in a place called Marble City. They have a big um, uh, limestone uh, cement factory down there. And they are they are quarrying the uh, the, the the Devonian limestone, the Siluro Devonian limestone down there, uh, and and I'm going to say I did see it there, and it's a it's as you would expect. It looks like a it looks like a hard it's a it's a hard gray limestone, light gray. Another another question: um, Would you please identify Crappy Point on the map, if possible? Was there a Crappie Point that we saw? Uh, no, I, did, I didn't mention I don't know anything about Crappie Point. So yeah, the yeah. crappie fishing is pretty good out here. Like I said, they have bass tournaments and the crappies are called the morel, the morel of Lake Ten Killer because they're so sought after, sought, sought after as a game fish. Um, there was a, a question. Um, where was it there? Do you see the Sillamore outcrops or is the base Woodford mostly below water level? I presume there are some adjacent to where the Silurian outcrops. That okay. was a question. All right, I'm gonna mispronounce Silamore, Silamore. Okay. Uh, uh, the, the Silamore is, I have not seen it around the lake. The Woodford Island is the, most ex is the biggest exposure of Woodford around the lake that I've seen. Uh, and the probably the only way that you're going to see Sillamore out there is to take scuba equipment off of Woodford Island and see if it outcrops underwater. Short of doing that, uh, in the 169 measured sections in Huffman's report, there are measured sections of Sillamore out here, and uh, they're not on the lake. They're in uh, there are other places. In uh, in northeast Oklahoma, but um, you can see it. You're just going to have to. They're not going to be on the lake. Okay, and then a question. Okay. Oh, go ahead. For a new student, where uh, in this area would you recommend to find fossil outcrops? I <laughs> suppose that means with or without a uh, watercraft. Yeah, um, that's a good question. <clears throat> I mean, definitely from the. Yeah, uh, I, I honestly uh, having having a boat makes it makes it a lot easier. Uh, I, I there's there are places, uh, for instance, up by my cabin. There's a there's a glade on a hillside up there that has um, has Chesterian fossils in it. Um, so I would say the way to find fossils out there is to identify a formation that contains fossils and then use the geologic map to find that formation in, in outcrop. But again, this is a heavily forested area. The outcrops aren't always um, that visible away from the lake. And so it's better to stick either to the lake or to stream valleys that feed into the lake. There are uh, road cuts. Now, having said that, there are, there are road cuts uh, that go through there. And, um, <clears throat> they have you can sometimes find fossils in them, but uh, the lake is the lake is much much better. That's that's not a very good answer. I, I nothing comes to mind offhand because I I generally don't don't collect um, I, I don't collect around there unless I find something on the lake. So you just don't want to share your best localities. Oh well, yeah, <laughs> no, it's a. Uh, uh, yeah, the Physonemus is pretty uh, is pretty special. You know, the rest of it's fairly common. Um, the uh, I, I'll tell you if you want zoophycus, just go to any sandstone outcrop of the Atoka, and they're and they're in there. They're thick. You know, we stopped at uh, we drove down to the dam and and stopped at that park, and there were bedding plains full of full of zoophycus. So, but some people don't consider trace fossils real fossils, though. Well, they're the only fossils that are in place. Everything else is transported. Yeah, yeah that's right. I, I'm sorry that was that wasn't a good answer, but it's it's not it's not something that I typically do. So, 
but yeah, that John, was interesting. I'm sorry, uh, last question. You showed uh, the outcrop, the, uh, the spillway, the dam. What is the outcrop just below that, the dam? Oh, uh, the dam is in the, is in the Atoka, but below that is the, is the, um, uh, the Bloyd. And there you go. Uh, there is a famous quarry uh, that they dug in the Bloyd uh, when they built the dam because they needed they needed rock and they they needed limestone and all they had was was Atoka sandstone. So they dug this quarry into the Bloyd, and this quarry is is just full of um, especially these petromites, the the blastoids. It is on private property. Uh, there are fossil groups that often that get permission. Uh, but if you Google Gore and uh, Gore, Oklahoma, and blastoids, you'll probably eventually get to a link that will tell you uh, where it's located and who the contact is. That if you want to go in there, yeah, that's a one thing leads to another. But that is the one place that I can say, yeah, if you can get permission to go in that quarry, you'll have a, you'll have a great time because lots of fossil collectors go in there. I think that's it. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. That was just totally amazing. I just want to thank you so much. And, and I'm really excited because I had this like dream of being able to do um, a kind of float trip geology this summer. And, uh, and th this is the first one. And, and I just, you did an outstanding job and just, uh, it's so exciting and so relevant. And, and also I hope that you follow up and maybe do a field guide for for it. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm keeping the I'm keeping the idea open uh, <laughs> of, of leading a trip there. Uh, uh, and let's just let's just leave it at that. I'm thinking about it. So, well, I know that Tulsa Geological Society would love to publish it. So. Yeah, a, a water-based field trip guide would be interesting, and then people would be on their own to go find these outcrops. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Is it like roadside, but then uh, water side? Yeah. <laughs> <Rip -bank> side. <laughs> Bank side. Something, something out of the ordinary. Well, I think also talking about um, fluvial systems and, and how and why the, the rivers change is, is incredibly useful and important. And it, I mean, just so fascinating. You talked about the floods that were in 2019. It was incredible to see how they changed the Arkansas River, for example. Yeah, well, I, I wasn't doing a lot of boating during the floods, but uh, I, do, <laughs> I do look for those, little, those uh, droughts and those times where they temporary, temporarily drop uh, the level of the lake. You know these these lakes they generate electricity, but it's not it's not their primary business. The only time they generate electricity is when they're wet, letting water out of the lake, which is probably only a few days out of the year. So, um, but sometimes they uh, they miss the mark and they let too much water out, and that's when you have to get out there and and get after it. Oh yeah, yeah flood control. But yeah, it's just interesting to see the cut banks and wrote it away and you see it. And then the little um, islands midstream. Anyway, well, thank you so much, Doug and, and John. And want to just let everybody know that you'll be getting an email with uh, a link to the recording. It's going to take me a little bit of time to to process it, but it will be there, and and we'll have a link to where you can go back with, uh, with the mirror site in. Um, YouTube. So thanks again. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Susan. That's great. Okay.